pastors here. There are four of us, and it has been a joy of being a pastor of this church, and it's going to be a joy to be here with you this weekend. And now let's introduce uh, Pastor Corey. He is one of the other pastors in this church. It has been a blessing to, to know the brother and to have him be one of my pastors. Uh, that's the beauty of having a church with multiple pastors is that we are each other's pastors. And, and Pastor Corey's done a great job uh, watching over my soul and teaching me uh, with his preaching ministry along with the other pastors as well. So I know that you're going to be blessed by him tonight and the work that the Spirit does through him. Today's subject is what is the purpose of the local church? So let's invite up and welcome Pastor Corey. I'll get out of your way in a second. Sorry. Sorry. Can you hear me? I appreciate the opportunity to serve you all tonight. So like Pastor Ed said, our, our uh, subject on this first session is what is the purpose of the local church? And if uh, we learned anything over the last two years from COVID that uh, people have a, most people in this country have a very poor understanding of what the church is, whether or not the church is essential and uh, just how vital it is to be a member of a local church. So let's go to the Lord for help. Our God and Savior, Lord, we need you as ever, O oh God. Lord, we thank you that you did not leave us in the dark to grope and speculate about who you are and what you have done to redeem sinners. But Lord, you have given us your word so that we would know what you have done in history, God, to save us. Lord God, be with us tonight. I pray, God, that you would be with the listeners. God, open their ears, soften their hearts so they may hear your word. And God, I pray that you would be with me so that I can do what you have tasked me to do, God, which is impossible from your Holy Spirit, and that's to glorify you in the hearts of men. So help me, O oh Lord. Pray the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart are acceptable in your sight. Oh, Lord, you are a rock and you are a redeemer. It's in the holy name of Christ we pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> before the first star was kindled, before the first living creature began to sing praises to his creator, Christ loved his church with an everlasting love. He spied her in the glass of predestination, pictured her in his divine foreknowledge, and loved her with all his heart. And it was for this cause that he left his father and became united to her, that he might redeem her. It was for this cause that he went with her through all the veil of tears, discharged her debts, and bore her sins in his own body on the tree. For her sake, he slept in the tomb, and with the same love, that brought him down, he has gone up again. And with the same beating heart, he has gone into glory, waiting for the marriage day when he shall come again to receive his perfected spouse, who shall have made herself ready by his grace. Never for a moment, whether as God over all, or as God and man in one divine person, or as dead and buried, or as risen and ascended, never has Christ's love changed for his church. Charles Spurgeon. The message of the gospel that is captured in the scriptures make it quite obvious that the Lord Jesus Christ has high regard for his church. He loves her with an everlasting love. He loves her with an atoning love and a love that is unmatched in all of human history. And it goes without saying that our culture does not share the same type of affection for the Lord's church that he does. Amen, church? Even uh, many professing Christians do not regard the church very highly. Many people who call themselves Christians see the church as an optional accessory. Many would call themselves Christians 
and want to maintain a spiritual life apart from the institution of the church. And rather than identify with Christ through committed church membership and gathered worship on the Lord's Day, they would prefer to untether themselves from the ministry and the mission of the church. They patch together a highly personalized spirituality from websites, from books, from podcasts, from informal fellowships, and, and have grown, some people have even grown partial to the idea of online worship instead of in-person fellowship with the body of Christ. And they do this for reasons of convenience and personal autonomy. They envision Christianity on their own terms, without spiritual oversight, without accountability, without discipline, or any shepherding care. And it is clear that people who behave this way have a diminished view of the importance of the local church. And I submit to you, if we in this room have this attitude and do such a thing, diminish the importance of the local church, we automatically diminish the context of the entire gospel in the New Testament. The New Testament books were written to particular local churches. The apostles were writing indirectly to the universal church, but they were writing directly to local churches in particular places. These churches were made up of real human beings in real history, in real time and space, who belonged to particular congregations in different cities. For example, the uh, epistle to the Romans was written to the church in Rome. Uh, All of the other letters of Paul, except for the pastoral epistles and Philemon, were written to local churches. And 1 and 2 Timothy were written to Timothy as he ministered to a local church in Ephesus. 1 Peter is addressed to local churches in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. And the book of Revelation is clearly written to seven particular local churches in Asia Minor. The New Testament was not written to or delivered to or into the hands of some heavenly, mystical, ethereal body. It was written to various local churches. The local church matters. If these local churches didn't exist, the New Testament wouldn't exist. And this is important because it's in the pages of the New Testament where you and I fully and finally meet our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And the New Testament provides you and I with a record of God's fulfilled promises for his people. The local church matters. And I want to say emphatically that the local church is important and the local church is essential. No one will ever believe that the local church is important or essential without first understanding the Lord's purpose for the local church. So this is the reason that our aim in this first session is to answer the question, what is the purpose of the local church? So if you look, if you got a bag, everybody should have a bag and you got a handout in there. You should have a handout. Well, there's a handout in there. And in that handout is a copy of the... uh, Chapter 26 of the 1689 Baptist Confession of Faith. So if you go to paragraph 5, that's where I'll be coming from to explain, to answer this question, what is the purpose of the local church? Now, you may be asking yourself, why are we going through the confession? Why are we not in the Bible? Well, Jude, the book of Jude, verse 3 says we have a common salvation and that the faith was delivered once and for all to the saints. So the faith that saved us is the same faith that saved our Christian brothers and sisters in the past. And we would do well to consult them to make sure that we're just not making up new things because, you know, Christianity been around 2,000 years. And I can almost guarantee you if you're saying new stuff, you're probably a heretic. So if you look at chapter 5, or I'm sorry, paragraph 5 of uh, chapter 26, the 1689 
Confession of Faith or the Second London Confession of Faith is it has a unique and extraordinary understanding of the nature of the church or ecclesiology, if you like big 25 cent words. Um, when we compare what the 1689 Confession says about the church to what the Westminster Confession says about the church, we see considerable differences. Now, the, the, the writers of the 1689, they were not trying to cause division with the church. They were actually trying to separate themselves from a different group called Anabaptists and show as much as possible how they aligned with their Presbyterian brothers. But where they differed, they explained where they differed and why they differed. And this is one of the areas where, where they differ the most in the area of the, the local church. So the Westminster Confession of Faith has six paragraphs on the church, while the 1689, as you can see in front of you, has 15 paragraphs on the church. And just like the New Testament, a majority of the 1689's teaching on the church in chapter 26 focuses specifically on local churches. So our Baptist forefathers believed that, the, that local church principles were as significant as universal church principles. So in a, if, if you get a chance, you can go read it. I won't, I won't do it for the sake of time, but the 1689 in chapter 26, it examines the, the nature and the structure of the universal church in verses and paragraphs uh, one through four. And in chapter four is asserting without reservation that Jesus Christ is the head of the church, not the pope, not your pastor, not your grandmother, but Christ. Christ and Christ alone is the head of the church. And that the Father has given Christ authority over all of the affairs of the church. Now, uh, Pastor Briggs is going to preach on that subject in the next session, so I won't preach his sermon. But I need to say, without reservation, that Jesus is the head of the church. And then the confession moves on to chapter 5 to show how the Lord Jesus Christ as head of the church, exercises his authority in the formation of local churches. So let's read paragraph 5. It says, In exercising the authority entrusted to him, the Lord Jesus, through the ministry of his word, by his spirit, calls to himself out of the world those who are given to him by his Father. They are called so that they will live before him in all the ways of obedience that he prescribed for them in his word. Those who are called, he commands to live together in local societies or churches for the mutual edification and fitting conduct of public worship that he requires of them while they are in the world. And there is one overarching idea that this paragraph makes regarding the local church, which is the formation of every local church is evangelical and mandatory. And when I say evangelical, what I mean is, is that the formation of every church rests on Jesus's power and authority to save sinners. The only reason why we sitting here is not because of some people 30 years ago built a church. It's because Jesus saved sinners. That's why you're sitting here today. And mandatory because as the head of the church, with full authority and government over the church, Jesus Christ has commanded those he has saved out of darkness to walk together. So this is the idea that will help us answer the question that's set before us. What is the purpose of the local church? And I'm going to answer this question in two parts. First part is the purpose of every local church is to be the expression of of Jesus' authority as head of the church. Every local church is the expression of Jesus' authority to be the head of a church. Every time you see a local church, you should be thinking one thing. Look at Jesus, save people. That's what you should be thinking. Jesus, you should see a local church and you should think Jesus is the head of the universal church and that's the proof. The second part of this question is, I'm sorry, the second part of the answer is the purpose of every local church is to fulfill the Great Commission. 
to fulfill the Great Commission through mutual edification and public worship. So let's look at the first part of the answer. The purpose of every local church is to be the expression of Jesus' authority as head of the church. I must, I'm going to have to say this again. I'm sorry, my wife told me one of my spiritual gifts is beating horses to death. So just bear with me. Listen, Jesus Christ is the great evangelist. Jesus Christ is the head of the church. He alone has the power to save sinners. He alone is the head of the body. Men, women, and children from every tribe, from every tongue, and from every nation across the span of human history will be saved by the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. In John chapter 10, verse 16, the word of God says, and Jesus says, And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them in also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. The Lord declared unambiguously that his sheep will hear his voice, become his flock under one shepherd with him as the head shepherd. John chapter 17, verse uh, 2 says that uh, since you have, you, the Father, have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. This verse says that God the Father has given to the Son authority over all flesh to impart eternal life to them. And if you look at the first sentence of paragraph five of this confession, it is clear that the author of this confession believed the the word of God at this point, that Jesus, he's exercising his authority and his power to save sinners. And he does that through the ministry of the spirit in his word. And it is in Christ and him alone that individuals are saved. It is our savior who opened our eyes. So that we're able to turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God. To receive the forgiveness of sins and have a place among those who are being sanctified in his name. Jesus and Jesus alone did that. And uh, every local church exists as an expression of his ability and power to redeem. Every particular congregation, regardless of size, regardless of number, regardless of location, demonstrate that it is God who justifies. The local church provides visible, tangible, and concrete displays of Jesus' power and his role as Savior and Redeemer. And the purpose of, G- uh, the purpose of First Baptist Church of the Lakes in every church is to be the authentication of the fact that Jesus is Lord. Family, if a person come to you and they claim to be a basketball player and they can't make a jump shot, don't believe them. Right? In the same way, we believe or Jesus believed that he he claimed, I'm sorry, Jesus claimed to be the savior and the redeemer of the world. And we believe him because every local church provides concrete evidence that Jesus saves sinners. If you want to know if Jesus can save sinners, just look to your left and look to your right and find somebody who's actually a Christian, and that's proof that Jesus saves sinners. The church is not a human institution. The church is not the invention of men. And every church, every church owes its existence to the triune work of God. Every local church is the creation of the Lord, and every local church belongs to Jesus. This is not Pastor Corey's church. This is not Pastor Rolo's church. This is not Pastor Vladimir's church. It's not Pastor Ed's church. This is Jesus' church. One commentator said it like this, that the church is in Christ the way Eve was in Adam. By grace, we are all in Christ and in his church. God made Eve out of the rib of Adam, and every one of his churches he framed out of the flesh, the very wounded and bleeding side of the Son of Man. Jesus came from heaven and sought his bride by exercising the authority that the Father gave him to call people out of darkness 
And the way in which he does this is through his word and spirit. It is the word of the gospel that is the power of God unto salvation. 1 Peter 1, 23 says, You have been born again, not of imperishable, I'm sorry, not of imperishable seed, I'm sorry, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God. And he continues on in verse 25 to say, The word is the good news that was preached to you. In Acts 5, verse 20, that an angel of the Lord called the preached gospel the words of this life. And Paul tells the Philippian church to hold fast to the word of life. That's Philippians 2, verse 16. And although the word of God, the word of life, and the word of Christ is the very source of everlasting life, the, 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 the word alone does not, the word does not call us alone. He does it together in cooperation with the spirit. Yes, it is true that the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit of joints and marrow. Yet the confession and the scriptures claim that Jesus exercised his authority through both the word and by his spirit. The word, the gospel, does not create life by itself and for that reason, the spirit and the, the work of the spirit are necessary in order to save sinners. The spirit comes with the word of God. It is the spirit that inspired the word of God. It is the spirit that inspired holy men to write the word of God. And that is it's the scriptures is where you meet Christ. You and I are we. It's the God. Jesus Christ was was was. I'm having an old man moment. Bear with me. (laughs) Listen, 2,000 years ago is when all of this happened in history. See, I say this all the time. The gospel is is, is linked to history. It means it's detached from me and you. It actually happened. This stuff actually happened. And because we are not in the past, the only access that we have to Christ and what he did for us is in the scriptures. And praise God that the, that the spirit of God inspired holy men to have a record of how you and I can be saved. You cannot be saved detached from the word of God. And it is the word of God working in conjunction with the spirit of God that causes you To hear the gospel, repent, and turn to Christ in faith. You did not do that by yourself. The pastors don't do that. The church doesn't do that. The word and the spirit is is what does that. And so the spirit, I'm sorry, in in, in, in 2 Thessalonians 2.13, the apostle Paul connects the, the Thessalonians being saved through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. So the work of the Spirit and the gospel are necessary for conversion. First Corinthians chapter 2, verses 3 through 5 asserts that, uh, Paul asserts that I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling, and my, my speech and my message were not implausible words of wisdom, but in the demonstration of the spirit and of power so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. His words, Paul's words are not grounded in something that men thought was a good idea. The gospel came from the throne room of heaven. The idea to save sinners is not something that the apostles contrived on their own. It came from the, from the throne room of God. And he says to the Thessalonians, our gospel came to you not only in word, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit with full conviction. All of that to say that the word and the spirit create and call the church because it calls Men and women and children from darkness into light commands them to fellowship together and creates what we call local churches. So, so far, what we looked at 
is that, that the Lord exercises his authority as head of the church, and he commands those he calls into the formation of local churches, right? So at this point, we need to, I just don't want to keep pointing you back to the confession. We need to look at what the word of God actually says to determine if this confession lines up with scripture or not. Amen? So often, the church often talks, I mean, I'm sorry, the scriptures often talk about the church. And it talks about the church in two ways. It talks about universal church, talks about local churches. And when the scriptures talk about local churches, it does so in three distinct ways. It refers to location, it refers to them actually gathering together, and it refers to their composition and how they're made up. So often when the New Testament talks about the local church, like I said, it refers to the location. Uh, Acts 2.46, in, in Acts 2.46, the, the Jerusalem church, they met at the temple as well as people's houses. And we read of the church in uh, Priscilla's and Aquila's house, the church in, in the house of Gaius, the church in the house of Philemon. And we also hear in the Bible where uh, the, the whole cities were referred to. Uh, I'm sorry, a church in a whole city was referred to. You have the church in Corinth and the church in Thessalonica and the church in Jerusalem, Antioch, Caesarea, and Ephesus. Sometimes multiple churches are referred to uh, in a singular region. You have the church throughout all of Judea, Galilee, and Samaria. And sometimes churches in particular ref regions are referred to in plural like the churches of Asia. But what's important to note is this. Every one of these mentions, the, the, the apostles are referring to local churches where people actually assemble in person. So, I know you heard this a thousand times, the church is not a building, and you need to hear it again. Okay? We need to be reminded that the church is not, the, the building does not make the church, but it is a gathering of God's people. The second way that the Word of God speaks about local churches is referring to their gathering. Hebrews 10, 25 said, encourages us not to neglect to meet together, as some of us are in the habit of doing, but encouraging uh, one another all the more as you see the day drawing near. Further, in the book of Acts, you see numerous accounts of believers gathering together in person. Acts 2.42 says that, and they devoted themselves to the apostles, teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to the prayers. Okay? Acts 4.31, and they... And when they prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken, and they were filled, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Acts 20, verse 7, teaches that the apostles, I'm sorry, that the disciples on the first day of the week were gathered together to break bread. They were gathered in a house in an upper room. In Acts 20, verse 8, as they gathered together in the upper room so that the church could celebrate the Lord's Supper and to hear Paul speak. They were together in person. And time does not permit me to go through every verse that proves that Christian people meet together in person. What we have recorded for us in the New Testament is very clear examples of the Christian church gathering together to celebrate the ordinances of Christ and the preaching of God's word. Put simply, local churches meet. They meet in person, in time and space. Therefore, virtual church ain't church. That's not real. Internet church is not real, okay? I don't care what nobody telling y'all. That ain't real. My friend Jason used to always say, if somebody give you a cake without sugar, that's not a cake, that's a biscuit, <laughs> right? That's just a biscuit. Internet church is not real. It does not exist. It's not a thing. It's like Santa Claus. It's like the Tooth Fairy in the Lakers three-point shooting right now. It's, don't, it's not real. It don't exist. Family, we know this. I mean, why are we even having this conversation? Why are we having this conversation? 
Y'all know this. We know this. You, if, if you live in Vegas and you got family, your grandmother or somebody, they live in another state, you call them and you say, hey, grandma, how you doing? Love you, miss you. And at some point, what are you going to do? You're going to purchase a plane ticket. You're going to fly and sit with them and have the exact same conversation. Why? Why? Why are you doing that? Because you know it's something different being in person with somebody else. Why are we having this conversation? You know why we having this conversation? Because some of us just don't want to obey the Lord. That's all. You just don't believe that Jesus is head of the church and he told you to meet. And you're just making up a bunch of excuses to be disobedient and you need to repent. The third distinct way that the Bible speaks about the local church is regarding the composition, its composition or how it's made up. The authors of the New Testament assumed they were writing to redeemed people. You understand that? They assumed that they were writing to the redeemed. The intro to Jude reads this. He's writing to those who are called, beloved in God the Father, and kept for Christ. The letter to the church of Rome begins with, to all those in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints. And even when the apostle Paul was writing to the troubled church in Corinth, It was written to the church of God that is in Corinth to those sanctified in Christ Jesus called to be saints together with all those who in every place call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And just by looking at the recipients of the letter of these letters, it makes clear that the authors understood themselves to be writing to an assembly of believers. An assembly of believers. Listen, family, the the apostles had some very hard things to say to the church whenever they would would see them getting wayward about its doctrine, about its purity, and about the church's steadfastness. That's because these things are very important to the Lord. And the doctrine, purity, and steadfastness of the church is connected to the doctrine, purity, and steadfastness of the individual members of every church. So if all of us are heretics, guess what we don't have no more, family? We don't have a church no more. You can't have a pure church with a bunch of people in it that's impure because the people make up the body. So when the apostles are writing these things, they assume they're writing to believers. And if you look back again at paragraph five of that confession, where it reads, those who are called, he commands to live together in local societies or churches, right? So in a word, this confession is saying that Jesus commands those who have been called by him to form a local church. That's what the confession is stating, right? So implicit in this statement is the idea that local churches will be formed together in, local, in particular locations. They will, be gathered, they will gather together regularly, and they are made up of people who have been called to salvation. And the Bible asserts that. So we can say with confidence at this point that this confession, this, chapter, this paragraph of the confession, agrees with Scripture by communicating that the purpose of every local church is to be the expression of the authority, of Jesus' authority as the church's head. Amen? Like I stated earlier, the answer to the question for us, what's the purpose of the local church? It's a two-part answer. The first part is the purpose of the local church is to be an expression of Jesus' authority. And the second part of the answer is the purpose of the, of the local church is to fulfill the Great Commission, to fulfill the Great Commission. So Jesus Christ, like I said, has the authority to call sinners out of darkness. He exercises this authority by calling believers to obedience. And all of this is done within the context of the Great Commission in Matthew 28, 19 through 20. Right? Go ye therefore and preach the gospel, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And teaching them to obey all that I have commanded you. 
the writers of this confession are simply putting forward the necessary consequences of the Great Commission. So when the Lord says, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you, the call to salvation comes to sinners through the gospel, through the Great Commission, and the goal is our obedience to be conformed to the image of Christ. And I ask you, how are we going to obey this command, teaching them all, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you? How is that supposed to be accomplished? It can only be accomplished in the local church. Only the local church can do that. The Great Commission commands comprehensive instruction of new disciples in a way of obedience. So the making of disciples that actually obey Jesus is long and laborious. It is a long and laborious process to get people from point A to point B. People just don't get saved and all of a sudden turn into saints. I know y'all believe that. That ain't true. It takes a long time to get people to be mature in the faith, to understand the gospel, to believe it, and to obey God. This process is long. This process is laborious. It, it cannot happen immediately. It will not happen in isolation, and it should not ever happen apart from the church. Fulfilling this aspect of the Great Commission requires believers to live together in relationship to other believers. The, the Christian faith was never intended to be a solo project. You were saved from one group of people. You were snatched out of one group of people and placed into another group of people. That's what Christianity is. That's what Christianity is. I know for 20, 30 years you've been hearing people say uh, Christianity is not a religion, it's a relationship. Actually, what it is is it's God putting you into a group of people for you to have a whole bunch of relationships. And some of them you're probably not going to like. And the reason I'm saying that is because, because it's not easy, because you're going to have to hear some things that you don't necessarily want to hear. You're going to have to hear about some of your sin. You're going to have to hear some, about some of your aloofness and your detachedness and how you, just, you didn't love your wife like you were supposed to, and you didn't submit to your husband like you were supposed to, and you didn't disciple your children like you were supposed to, and you're not working unto the Lord as if you were supposed to. Who is the people that's supposed to be telling you that? It's the church. And this demands time. This demands that you open yourself up and afford Christians the latitude to tell you when you're wrong. And for these reasons, the Great Commission assumes and demands the formation and the existence of local churches. You cannot obey that last leg of the Great Commission if there is no local church. If you're not joined to a local church, you can't obey the command. You can't do the teaching and you can't be the one getting taught if the local church don't exist and you're not a part of it. So only, I want to say this, only, 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 the local church can provide the necessary accountability and teaching for gospel obedience. And therefore, the purpose of the local church is to fulfill the Great Commission. Our Lord also, that's not the only thing, is that our Lord and Savior commands spiritual accountability and discipline to take place in the confines of the local church. Matthew 18, verses 15 through 20, the Lord commands believers, it says this, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his faults between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you've gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take, two, take one or two others along with you that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. This is verse 17. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. That is a command. That is, the, the Lord is, that is a command from the, from the mouth of God. So the Lord commands believers to bring offenses to the church and then commands the church 
to rebuke the unrepentant. And if, if this is a command, then by necessity, he's commanding the existence of local churches. If I tell you to clean your room, guess what you got to have, family? A room. <laughs> like, that's just common sense. How can Christians obey the Lord in this passage if no local churches exist? If people get saved and called out of darkness and people are redeemed and regenerated and they don't become members of the local church, how can you obey this command? You can't. Listen, this is real simple. When Jesus says tell it to the church, he assumes it's a church for you to tell it to. These commands cannot be obeyed, and these steps cannot be taken if there is no organized, identifiable local church. You got to know where it is, and you got to know how to be a part of it, and you got to be in it. Amen? Therefore, the existence of the local church is necessary, necessary for believers to obey the Lord. You cannot obey the Lord without the local church. In the last sentence of this paragraph, in the the paragraph 5 and the 1689, it, it cites Matthew 18 as the basis for the statement that those who are called he commands to live together in local societies or churches for their mutual edification. So the passage in Matthew 18, 15 through 20, And the passage in Matthew 28, 18 through 20, the Great Commission, these are clear and obvious directives from the Lord Jesus Christ, the head of the church, and that obedience, the the obedience that's called for in these texts, demand and assume that Christians will be a part of a local church. That's not Christianity if you are not joined to a body of believers. Amen? Amen. Internet church is not real. That's not real. That's just you're being disobedient to the Lord. And you don't want to bow to him as Savior. Jesus is king. Jesus is the king of his church. Obey him. The fact that these two passages that we went through demand and assume the existence of a local church gives us the second part of our answer, what is the purpose of the local church? The purpose of the local church is to be the fulfillment of the Great Commission. So in conclusion, the Great Commission demands the formation of local churches. He commands, the the command that the Lord gives to tell it to the church in Matthew 18 demands the existence of local churches and the formation of called out believers demonstrate the fact that Christ is the head and has authority over every local church. So with that, we declare that the importance of the local church and the purpose of every local church is to be the expression of Jesus' authority and power as his head and to fulfill the Great Commission. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord God, we thank you. Lord God, we thank you for saving us, calling us out of darkness. And Lord God, we help us, God, to believe your word. Help us to obey you, O God. The flesh the world and the devil is warring against everything that, would, that you have said is right and good. So help us, God, by the aid of your spirit to believe you and obey you. It's in the holy name of Christ we pray. Amen.